Today's video is a video that I've been holding off making for a long time now. And this is despite the fact that I'd say this video has got to be up there as one of the most requested videos on this channel. Now the reason it's taken so long is pretty much for the same reason I gave in my Vesemir video. I want to do this character justice. I'll probably never be able to, but as it's been almost a year since I covered Vesemir, I feel like it's time to discuss another Witcher from the School of the Wolf. So, I've decided to make today's video on the Witcher Eskel of the School of the Wolf. Just like most witches, not much is actually known about Eskel's origins, but we can assume he was most likely claimed by the Law of Surprise, as were many witcher candidates. This means that for one reason or another, a wandering witcher from the School of the Wolf claimed him as his reward and then brought him to Kaer Morhen. At Kaer Morhen, he would have been trained in the same way as many of his fellow witches, but what's particularly interesting about when Eskel trained is that he trained with arguably the most famous of the witches, Geralt of Rivia. And not only that, but it is a well-known fact that whilst these two trained together, they became good friends. In the books, Geralt even reminisces about his youth with Eskel when recounting a memory in which the two witches in training captured a giant forest bumblebee and tied it to a jug with some thread. The two then fell into fits of laughter, watching it buzz around, only to be caught by Vesemir, their fencing instructor and tutor, who then tanned their hides with a leather strap. It of course wasn't all fun and games though, as Eskel went through the first round of selections with Geralt, as well as the murderous changes, the general witcher training such as running the infamous gauntlet, and the trial of the grasses. I've made videos about the Witcher Trials in the past, but just for a key detail, most Witcher candidates do not survive these trials. However, as we know, Eskel made it through them. Not much is known about Eskel's adventures not involving the famous White Wolf, although we do hear about a couple of contracts and adventures the Witcher took in his time. I imagine most of the adventures he went on were fairly self-contained and didn't have the stakes that can be seen throughout Geralt's journey. However, as you will now hear in a moment, he did still get up to some pretty interesting stuff. I mean, for a little piece of background information that applies to the events before the games and during the books slash games, Eskel, as well as Geralt and Lambert, are known to generally try and make it to Kaer Morhen every winter, in order to winter there. So at least we know what Eskel probably did most winters, spent time with his fellow School of the Wolf witches at Kaer Morhen. But anyway, that fact aside, let's get on to Eskel's adventures. In The Witcher 1, there is actually an entire DLC that involves Eskel pretty heavily, and it is known as the Price of Neutrality. In this DLC, we are introduced to Eskel's surprise child, who is known as Deirdre Ademen. This character became Eskel's surprise child after he saved her father, the Prince of Kangorn. Eskel was offered whatever he wanted, and of course he then claimed the lore of surprise. However, when the Prince returned home with Eskel in tow, he found his wife to be pregnant. This made the child Eskel's surprise child. However, this child was born with supposedly the Curse of the Black Sun. I'll probably make a video discussing this character in the future, but in regards to Eskel, she obviously doesn't appear in The Witcher 3 and isn't really mentioned. The only thing he still carries with him as a result of his interaction with his surprise child is the scar on his face, as she accidentally attacked him. If you want to know now how these events happened, I have actually played the entire DLC on my channel, and all in all, it only took me about 50 minutes to get through, so you can probably just play it yourself if you just want to know that story. The timeline of when this event happened is a little bit muddy, but based on the fact Eskel has this scar when he is first introduced in the books, we can assume it happened before Blood of Elves, hence why I'm discussing it first. I mean, to be honest guys, this is an event that I would describe as kind of canon to the Witcher games, as a lot of questionable lore decisions are made in that DLC. Anyway, moving on, I want to discuss the events involving Eskel in the books. Eskel is first introduced in the Witcher book Blood of Elves, where he is encountered by Geralt and Ciri, when Geralt arrives at Kaer Morhen with Ciri for the first time. When they arrive at Kaer Morhen, Eskel is there, and he quickly deduces that Geralt has returned to Kaer Morhen, because at first he wasn't sure if it was Geralt or not. After entering the keep, Geralt then went to put Roach in the stables, therefore leaving Ciri with Eskel, and Eskel basically just asks Ciri a few questions. At first she's terrified of him because of his voice, and 
I suppose, general appearance. Siri even thinks to herself that he smelled of both sweat and smoke and couldn't be human, as no human could have a face like his. He notices she's a girl and isn't exactly happy, but soon after he's smiling at her and she changes her opinion regarding his face, believing him to now resemble a human and just putting her initial impression down to his scar. Geralt then returns and without saying a word, the two witches fall into an embrace, gripping each other so hard that they strain their shoulders. I think this just shows the clear bond they have, as we haven't really seen Geralt be affectionate in this way with all that many people. The two witches, along with Ciri, then go into the main keep of Kaer Morn to be greeted by Vesemir, and this is pretty much where that chapter ends. Eskel then next appears when Triss visits the Witcher's Keep. At this point, Sir is more adjusted with the Witchers and have been training like any other candidates, although the Witchers never planned to turn her into an actual Witcher, just none of them had any idea what to really do with a girl, as they didn't have much experience taking care of girls. They'd obviously only really had young boys at Kaermorn at that point. But anyway, most of the observations in this point in the book surrounding Eskel are from Triss's point of view, and when she first sees him stood by Geralt, she remarks at how the two could be brothers. Of course, except for his hair, and the disfiguring scar marking his face, as although Geralt's face isn't exactly free of scars, Eskel's is much worse. Later on, Triss realises that the witches basically don't know what they're doing with Ciri and scolds them, and at that point Eskel walks over to her, bends down low, takes her hand, and kisses it respectfully. Triss then pulls her hand away, but it is important to note that she did not do this out of anger or annoyance, but because he emanated powerful magic, so she felt a piercing vibration that that triggered from his touch. She notes it is even more powerful than the power she senses from Geralt's touch, obviously telling us that Eskel is more naturally gifted in magic than the White Wolf. Eskel then asks Triss for help and rubs his scar in embarrassment. Then a short scene follows involving Ciri and a dress. From there, the events surrounding Triss being at Kaer Morn with the Witchers involve her helping with Ciri as well as having the occasional conversation with the Witchers. At one point she takes Eskel's drink in order to try and induce one of Ciri's visions, but that's not so important in regards to Eskel, so I'm going to leave that for a Ciri video or maybe a video where I talk about Triss's time at Kaer Morn. But having said that, I think it's time to move on. Eskel's next appearance is technically set before the events described in Blood of Elves, so all the stuff with Triss at Kaer Morn, but as it appears in The Lady of the Lake, I thought I'd just talk about it now. So the scene involving Eskel in this book is just a short scene in which Eskel and the other witches are incredibly concerned, as Ciri had entered a trance-like state in which she said both Geralt and Cohen would be killed by teeth. That's about it, although if you've read the books, you'll know that ultimately this vision did turn out to be true, although for Geralt, it's it's a little bit more complicated. This brings us to the events involving Eskel in The Witcher 1, as he doesn't appear in the books past that point. In The Witcher 1, Eskel is first encountered, along with Vesemir, when Geralt arrives at the keep, with his memory lost and having just escaped the Wild Hunt. Eskel and Vesemir then return into the keep. Eskel doesn't really do much in The Witcher 1 base game other than talk to Geralt as he's getting brought back to Kaer Morn. Of course he takes part in the battle against the Salamandra, but nothing particularly noteworthy happens involving him. All I can say is that after the events of the Salamandra's attack on Kaer Morn, the remaining witches, this being Geralt, Eskel, Vesemir and Lambert, and the sorceress Triss Merigold held a funeral for a witcher who died in the battle. He was known as Leo. Eskel then stated that he would go west in search of the salamandra that escaped with the Kaermorn secrets, as he enjoyed the coastal climate. Geralt also went to search for the secrets, and that's basically what the Witcher 1 story is. We then technically don't see Eskel all the way up until he is hunting a fork tail in The Witcher 3, and I'm not counting Geralt's dream sequence at the start of The Witcher 3, as obviously this is a dream and we don't actually see Eskel, just a dream involving Eskel. However, we do find out some information regarding what this Witcher had been up to before The Witcher 3, and we find this information out from Eskel himself. When drinking with his fellow Witchers, Eskel revealed that since they last saw each other, he had completed a contract involving a higher vampire in Aldersburg, which is a city in the Northern Kingdom of Edirne. 
The higher vampire that he was hunting was only interested in young women from the upper class, so in order for Eskel to catch it, he had to devise a plan. He got his client to throw a masquerade ball for the city's nobles in order to lure the vampire out of hiding. Eskel then attended the ball and made a deal with a young alchemist, who agreed to load up on Fistech, vodka, and magic mushrooms. She then went out into the garden and acted as bait for the vampire. The vampire found her, drank his fill, and basically Eskel didn't really have to fight at that point, just kill it and get his money. We also know that at some point before The Witcher 3, Eskel slept with a succubus and took Fistech with the very same succubus, which does seem very out of character for him, but I personally think that it does add a lot of depth to his character, as it shows that he can be human too. It's not just some one-dimensional character that basically just thinks and does one thing, he's actually capable of doing things he might regret. This brings us to Eskel in The Witcher 3, and I imagine those of you watching will already know his story in The Witcher 3, but for a very basic overview, he is first found hunting forktails in the Valley of Kaer Morn. He had been sent to kill them by Yennefer in order to gather ingredients for the Trial of the Grasses, that Yennefer hoped to perform on Uma in order to lift his curse. Eskel wasn't just hunting them for this reason though, because, as Geralt noted when he first arrived there in The Witcher 3, the forktails had actually become a bit of a nuisance. You, as Geralt, then help him hunt and kill the Forktail, and then race him back to Kaer Morn. You can then choose to get really drunk with him and your fellow Witcher Lambert, and if you choose to go so far, can then dress up in Yennefer's clothing and mess around with her Megascope. The day after this, Eskel, as well as all the other School of the Wolf Witchers and Yennefer, perform the Trial of the Grasses on Uma, although all the Witchers feel uncomfortable about Yennefer's plan. Despite the reservations though, the curse is reversed, revealing Uma to be the Elven Sage Avalach. Avalach then reveals the location of Ciri to the Witchers, and then the Witchers hatch a plan to go and get her, and then fight the Wild Hunt at Kaer Morn. Geralt can then go and gather allies, and then get Ciri, whilst Eskel, the other Witchers, and Yennefer prepare for the attack. Attack. When Geralt arrives back at Kaer Morn, Eskel can be seen focusing before the coming battle, whilst everyone else basically strategizes and tries to prepare. I think this shows his method of doing things requires a lot of focus, and I like to imagine he's like this before his contracts. Anyway, the battle happens, Eskel helps defend, and at one point faces off against the Wild Hunt General, Caranthia. He holds his own pretty well, but Caranthia appears to be winning through the use of his teleporting abilities. Luckily, Ciri steps in with her abilities and helps Eskel out. I think the fact that Eskel even stood up to Caranthia that significantly though just shows his skill, as if you know Caranthia's story, you'll know just how special and skilled this individual is. And I have actually made a video on Caranthia if you want to find out more about him. This brings us to the end of the Battle of Kaer Morn, and Eskel can be seen attending his mentor, Vesemir's funeral. And after a brief conversation with Geralt, he reveals that he will soon be leaving Kaer Morn. However, his character journal entry states that he took over the responsibility of watching Kaer Morn after Vesemir's death so perhaps he did ultimately decide to stay. We don't really know, as nothing has been said, but perhaps it will be revealed in a future game. That's pretty much everything we know about Eskel, and as you can see, it's not really all that much. Despite this though, he is an awesome character, as I'm sure many of you would agree, and I've heard his name come up a lot from fans when discussing what a future Witcher game could be. Perhaps a game where Eskel rebuilds the School of the Wolf, or maybe we just see what he got up to after the Battle of Kaer Morn. The only thing I have left to say about Eskel though, is just a brief description of his appearance. He has short brown hair, the classic witcher eyes, and his own set of red armour incorporating many of the School of the Wolf style elements. He also, as I've drawn attention to a lot in this video, has a large disfiguring scar across his face. Anyway guys, that's it for today's Witcher lore video, and I hope you've all enjoyed. This video has been a long time coming, and I know how important this character is to many of you, so I hope I've been able to do him justice, or at the very least, told you something you might not have known or picked up on before about this awesome character. But anyway, be sure to subscribe for more Witcher videos, as I make them every week, and if you subscribe you won't miss them. Also, be sure to like today's video to support this sort of content, and to let me know you enjoyed it. My question for this week, 
week is quite simply, do you have any cool ideas for how Eskel could be involved in the next Witcher game? This could be as the protagonist, or maybe as a side character, but I just want to hear what you guys think, as I think it'd be awesome if he returns in some sort of way and is fleshed out even more, as I think he's just such an interesting character. Be sure to follow my Twitter and Twitch, and finally, as always, a big thank you to the Patreon pledges. You guys are honestly so amazing, and thank you all so much for your support. I really appreciate what you all do, and I'm glad to put all of your names at the end of these videos. Also, just thank you to everyone that likes, subscribes, and comments, as that's just really nice too, and I do appreciate it. Anyway, that's it for today's video, and I'll see you in the next one. Have an awesome rest of the week.